a lot of people um, don't really understand um, why I deal with these things from this perspective. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, you know, I'm trying to curry favor with white people. Some people will say I'm insensitive. Some people will say I don't understand blackness or black the black struggle or or or, or whatever, you know. Um, but here's the deal. My first book was published in 2004. The title of the book was The Ever-Loving Truth, Can Faith Thrive in a Post-Christian Culture? Mm -hmm. So here I am at Oxford, you know, to, around, you know, 99, 2000, and I'm working on um, my, my dissertation, a critical analysis of the history and theology of the nation of Islam, right? Um, the, the, the black Muslim movement, Malcolm X and you know, and these guys and Elijah Muhammad and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and I'm there at Oxford and I'm running into this pernicious influence of liberalism and postmodernism. Mm. And I'm, I'm seeing this stuff. And so I, I, I just really begin to be wary of these threats um, this, this threat of, of, of post-Christian culture, of the, these, these sort of influences. And so I started, um, you know, looking into things like Foucault and Derrida and, you know, you know all, all of this sort of stuff. And also, mm -hmm. you know, ideas of inclusivism and all these, all these liberal ideas, right, that are, that are coming to the church. And eventually I start reading about people like, you know, again, not just Marx and, and, and Hegel and people like this, you know, the sort of, sort of the classical Marxist stream, but also Antonio Gramsci and the Frankfurt School um, mm -hmm. and this sort of this sort of new stream of of cult cultural Marxism and critical theory and so on and so forth. And so I've been talking about this stuff for nearly two decades now. Mm -hmm. And it's it's and I've been saying for nearly two decades now that this stuff is dangerous and that its foundations are are creeping in and and will have devastating effects. And so this is kind of how I came to this. And the way I described it to someone, you know, because people have said things like, well, no, well, you talk about this, but then you don't talk about that. Or you talk about this, but then you don't mention, you know, these justice issues or this or that or the other. And th what I say to them is, I've been standing on this wall for almost two decades, mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying that there are no other walls to stand on, mm -hmm. but this, this one's mine. Right. This, is, this is the wall that I've been standing on. And by the way, the enemy that I've been saying for two decades is trying to come over this wall. Well, well they're over the wall now. Mm -hmm. And so this is definitely not the time when I'm going to abandon this wall. Right. Um, so it's interesting. The other interesting thing is, so I wrote, that was my first book in 2004. And then I wrote a trilogy of books, um, Family Driven Faith, Family Shepherds, What He Must Be If He Wants to Marry My Daughter. Mm -hmm. And these books really, I put in the category of applied apologetics, an mm -hmm. apologetic for biblical manhood and the importance of, of, of the family and family discipleship. I've been pushing home education um, and home, you know, family discipleship for a long time. The interesting intersection between these things is this. Uh, according to critical theory, um, you know, th there, are, there are a lot of forms. Racism takes a lot of forms. It is inherently structural, and it takes a lot of forms. And one of the forms, you know, Robin D'Angelo is famous for this. She calls it aversive racism. Right. And she gives a, a list of things that qualify as aversive racism. And one of the things that qualifies is attributing disparities between majority and minority or between oppressors and oppressed. If you mm -hmm. attribute those disparities to anything other than racism, that is aversive racism. Right. And so one of the things that people, you know, are harping on is, you know, people who are talking about, um, you know, fatherlessness and, um, you know, abortion and, you know, these sorts of things and, and, and educational issues and stuff within uh, minority communities, the immediate accusation is you're victim blaming mm. and you're perpetuating white privilege and white supremacy because you are attributing 
disparities to something other than racism and saying that people can and should do better, right? This is just not allowed. Right. And so inter interestingly enough, so here's, here's, look at my publishing record and the stuff that I've written and people are using the things that I've been writing. But by the way, I grew up without a father. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a community. I, I can remember. I didn't know people who had fathers, mm -hmm. right? It just, it, just, it just didn't happen. It just did not compute that you had a mother and a father in your home. And so I experience these devastating effects. I see these devastating effects. And I start writing about these things because of the devastating effects that I've seen. And ironically, because I put the emphasis on that syllable, <laughs> people <laughs> say that I've actually internalized racism. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, it's just, it's just, it's pernicious. It's, in, it's incredibly pernicious. 